couple of weeks ago, I was actually giving a similar set of talks in, in Parliament House in Canberra. So obviously, we know that for the last few years, and increasingly recently, the issue of marine reserve design is is high on the political agenda. A lot of people are very interested in this issue. And effectively, I'm going to cover two questions. One is how who how do they get put where they're put? Who designs them? How are they designed? Is that just Greenies drawing lines randomly on maps, or is there any science to that? We'll talk about that. And secondly, when you've got them in place, do they do what you want them to do, which is primarily to protect biodiversity? That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, just to give you a bit of history, first of all, the science of conservation planning, again, is a science. It's a science that's 30 years old. And this is the science that's been developing over the last 30 years about where do we put things like national parks on the land or marine sanctuaries in the sea. Uh, there are thousands of papers, many in the world's best science journals, about this science. So I think the first the important thing I want to say is it is a science, some conservation biology, it's not a movement. And uh, there are a number of professors now all around the world who are professors of conservation science. In the past, however, before the theory of conservation planning emerged, most people put national parks on the land. I mean, we didn't have marine parks in the 1980s at all, hardly, other than a few tiny places. They basically, basically put places nobody else wanted, that had big charismatic things and a few waterfalls, and they called them a national park. And that was the way we got our first national parks in Australia, often for recreational purposes. But through the 80s, 90s, and even now, the science of marine planning has really solidified and now it includes many, many other things. And it says it's not just about big spectacular things like whales, but it's also about all biodiversity. There's 30 million species on the planet. And we need to think about them all. There's ecosystem processes, there's threats, and also most importantly, in fact the innovation that our group has pushed on the world is that this has to be socially and economically responsible. So there's money. And so effectively, even though I'm a professor of maths and I'm a professor of ecology, I'd like to think of myself as an economist. The economists don't like to think of me as an economist, but effectively what I do is what economic modelers do and what engineers do. That's so why I'm an aspiring economist, they won't let me in. Um, so these are the principles. The principles of conservation planning says, and uh, this is really fundamental to the situation of South Australia at the moment, that a marine plan is comprehensive, that means it needs to have a bit of everything. So there's thousands of species out there, hundreds of habitat types, all these biophysical processes, and whatever you do, you want to make sure you have a bit of everything, a bit like Noah's Ark. Adequate? Now, Noah's Ark, uh, two of every species, most conservation biologists probably think that wouldn't have worked very well. Two is not <laughs> enough, so you need to have enough of everything for it to function. That's what adequacy is. Representative, the bits you pick are typical, like Parliament represents the people of South Australia. One would hope that parliamentarians are a typical cross-section of society. No, but there, there you go. That's the idea of representation. From a scientific perspective, we want a representative park system. And that used to be the way people thought of it. It's called the car planning process. But we've added the end, and we've turned something that's a car into care, which I think is a lot more friendly. We've added economics, efficiency. And so while you're achieving all these conservation goals, you also want to do it annoying as few people as possible, because otherwise it just won't happen. You want to minimise the economic impact on other users of the land and the sea. And that's the economic side. Um, and in a sense, I, I won't go through these too much. I think I've already said them, comprehensive, get a bit of everything, uh, adequate. You know, you just can't conserve half a hectare of every habitat type, it's not going to have any ecosystem function. It has to be big enough to function properly. Uh, it's tough adequacy, and, and we can talk for a long time about that issue. It's not easy to work out what is enough. And in some senses, with marine planning, what we've done, say with Great Barrier Reef, where 4.7% was conserved up to 2004, they did many assessments over a decade or more, and they saw it wasn't enough, and they moved the protection up to 33%. And now they're doing continuous assessments and they've got to decide, is that too much? Is it not enough? Does it need to be bigger? So it's actually a moving feast, what is enough? But certainly 4.7% was considered in one of the best studied regions in the world to be completely inadequate for conservation. That is sanctuary, no tax science. And then 
the variety, this is even tougher because in the marine systems in South Australia we're talking about thousands of species, so often this is a hard thing to meet. You just have to use the data we've got. And finally, objective, basically, uh, as I stupidly said to the advertiser today, piss off as few people as possible, so that may be the only thing in which we call it. <laughs> so they're the fundamental principles. They've been debated and argued, and they have now bedded down over the last 10 or 20 years as conservation planning. The planning process is, is, is a big and long process, as this state will know. Because when I was here between 1990 and 2000, in 1991 and 2, we were already having meetings about the marine reserve system in South Australian state waters. In 1992, 1995, I was meeting with Senator Hill about the federal rezoning, federal uh, Commonwealth seas. And he, I think, envisaged that within two or three years, Australia would have a huge marine park system in the Commonwealth waters between three miles and 200 nautical miles. Uh, that has not yet happened. Uh, it looks as though it may happen, but it's, it's a very slow process because of all that stuff up the top is understanding what you want, compiling data. There's been a lot of that going on all over the country at different scales, uh, involving stakeholders as much as possible. And sometimes we admit the governments don't do that well as, as much as they could. Arguably, what I'm going to talk about now is how do we actually decide where the parks go, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So they're the principles. In the end, what we're ending up with, uh, these principles apply on the land and see what we want to do is have a zoning map. We want to have a zoning map that tells people what can happen where. Uh, places where anybody can do anything they like, which is what most of the oceans like now, all the way through to, I think that's a bit of the Great Barrier Reef, the pink bits, uh, nobody can go into it at all. And over that last decade or so, there's been a lot of statements made by marine scientists coming to a consensus about um, the role of marine sanctuaries, the utility of marine sanctuaries, the need for marine sanctuaries. <coughs> as part of the whole management of marine systems. Obviously, we've been managing marine systems for a long time, in some cases well, in some cases badly, through the fisheries management operations and a whole heap of other things to do with pollution. Okay.